Esta é a hora da adoração Vem dar a Ele teu coração Vem assim como estás para Welcome to you. And for those who are online, welcome to you as well. We've got some exciting things planned for today. We get to participate in dedications and baptisms today. So we get to partner with families as brothers and sisters in Christ. And also we get to hear a testimony of a life that's been changed. It's an exciting day. And along with that, we're going to be singing in some different languages this morning. But first, let's call each other into worship. So I invite you guys to stand. And as you do that, if you notice that there's room to scoot toward this middle aisle, um, that would be great as we might have families who would like to be in here to witness dedication and baptisms live. And that would make room for them. So thank you for that. Let's call each other by reading scripture together. We want to refocus and recenter ourselves on our amazing God who we're here to worship. So I'm going to read this first slide and then I invite you to read the underlying portion with me. This is how God's love was revealed among us. God sent his one and only son into the world 
that we might live through him. Read this with me. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus from the dead. Yes. I think we can put our hands together for this one. tells us to go and make disciples of all nations. And as we just sing, it's a privilege to declare his name to every nation, tribe, and tongue. And we live in a unique place where the nations have come to us. 
So as we celebrate that, we're going to be reading the confession in Portuguese and in English. Nele temos a redenção por meio do seu sangue, o perdão das transgressões, de acordo com as riquezas da sua graça. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. This next song we're going to sing is an antiphonal song. And what that means is there's going to be a call and there's going to be a response. And so Ryan's going to lead the song and he's going to sing the call. And then we are all going to join together and sing the response. And as we do that, we're preaching the truth of God to each other. And as we talked about earlier, the nations have come to us. And so some of these responses are going to be in English. Some will be in Spanish. There will be some in Yoruba and also some in Portuguese. And within our own church at Five Oaks, we have people who speak these languages. So as we sing, I hope that we can realize that God transcends languages and he transcends countries. And that there is nothing that makes us right with God except the blood of Jesus. So let's sing this together. Sangre de Jesus. 
Father, that is so true. Lord, it is nothing but your blood that we are saved by, and we are so thankful and overwhelmed by that truth. Lord, we come to you broken and sinful and in great need of your saving. We are grateful for the work you did on the cross for us and that we can be saved and washed and made clean because of what you did. And as we come now to you, we offer our hearts to you and our minds as we listen to your word, as we celebrate these dedications and later on those baptisms, Lord. It is a day of great joy and rejoicing. We are so grateful and we love you, Jesus, and we give this time into your hands. Amen. You may be seated. Hello and welcome. My name is Kelly and I serve as the kids director. We're so excited that all of you are here this morning and just celebrating with us as we um, journey through this faith milestone together. And so if you are joining us online, I want to welcome you as well. We're live streaming all of our services for friends and family who can't be here for these celebrations. And if you are newer, we're so excited that you're here. Maybe you're just here um, supporting friends and family who are doing family dedication or baptism, or maybe you're just newer and checking things out and wanting to know what Five Oaks is all about. And so if you're in that boat, we would love to invite you to something called Pizza with the Pastors. It's a really great time to get to know other people who are new and uh, make some connections with the staff and the pastors as well. And the next one coming up is May 18th and 19th. We have it after the 4.30 service on Saturday and also at noon on Sunday. We have free childcare and free pizza and salad for everyone. So we really try to make it as easy as possible. It's also only about an hour, so it's pretty quick and just a really great way to start making those first steps and figuring what it is to, to be Five Oaks. And um, so if you're interested in that, what you do is you take your worship guide here and the bottom of this is your connect card and then you would fill, fill that out just with your name and information and just write pizza on it. And then someone will get in touch with you for the details regarding that. You can also do your connect card um, online with the QR code if you prefer that. And then, um, but if you have the paper copy, you'll take it and there are boxes in the back of this room and there's more in the commons and they say connect cards and offerings and you just simply drop those in there. And then speaking of your connect card, we do ask you to fill it out each and every week. You can just write your name that you're just here. It's helpful for us to know who's here. Um, otherwise you can write down um, any questions or comments. Um, definitely please write down any prayer requests that you have. We have a whole team that prays over our prayer requests, our staff pray to, and our, our board and elders. So we definitely love to hear what's going on with you and just uh, be able to lift you up in that way and also celebrate with you if there's a praise you want to tell us about. So again, um, those go in those black boxes and we just, we just love hearing from you guys. So um, this week, obviously, it's the Faith Milestone celebration, so we don't have, have a fun video or anything like that besides the family videos, which you'll see soon. Um, but there are so many big things coming up, so I just want to draw attention to your worship guide because there's so much going on coming up. You don't want to miss it. And then there's the QR code on the worship guide, too, that has even more. So just know there's a lot going on. Um, again, we're at a big celebration today, but there's other events you don't want to miss as well. So right now, I want to invite up our families. We have three families who are joining us this morning, so I invite them on stage. Everyone's so well behaved. It was a little wilder last night. <laughs> All right. Well, at Five Oaks, we just love celebrating. Don't you just love getting gifts from someone you love? Well, family dedication is a time of celebrating new life, which is a gift. The Bible says it this way in Psalm 127.3. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. So we celebrate family dedication again because children are a gift from God, and the Bible teaches us also that salvation is a gift from God as well. We want to steward both of these gifts by walking alongside our children and helping them unwrap the gift of salvation in their lives. And in family dedication, we are committing before God, one another, and the watching world 
that we will love our children as gifts from God himself. We will steward our children for God's glory, their good, and as a blessing to the world. Parents, you are saying today, I want to pass on gospel truth to the next generation, and I need God to do this through me. So now let's watch some short videos introducing our families to you. Hi, we're the Danner family. I'm Emily, this is Olivia, her big sister Adeline. And I'm Jeremy. And the verse that we chose for Olivia is Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. And it reads, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. We're the Walshers. I'm Brian. I'm Andrea. I'm Harrison. I'm Elliot. Today we are going to dedicate Theodore John Walsh, and his life verse is Zephaniah 3.17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Hi, we're the Swartz family. Today we're dedicating Luke and Zoe. And the verse we've chosen to read for them today uh, comes from Psalm 21, 7 through 8. It's going to be, The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. For this dedication milestone, we believe it's not only an important step for the parents and children, but also for the congregation as well to come alongside with love and support. So I will have some questions for the parents first, but then after that, I will have some questions for you as well. All right. Do you all accept the responsibility as your child's primary faith influencers? Will you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength? Will you love your children with the unconditional love of Christ and pray for them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? Yes. And now I have some questions for all of you. If you agree to these, please respond with, we will. Will you partner with these parents by praying for them as they lead their children spiritually? We will. will you partner with these parents by teaching their children with love at church and modeling a Christ-like lifestyle in support of what the parents are teaching and modeling? All right, let's pray for all these families. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here today and just celebrating with these wonderful families and just these special children, God. We want to pray a special blessing over all of them today and just surrender them back to you, God. We're just so grateful that these parents are here making this commitment in front of everyone and just showing how much they love you and how much they want their children to know you and love you at a young age. And God, we pray that to be the truth for their lives. We pray that they would come to know you and just be so excited to share your truth with anyone in their path, God. We pray that they would have a very strong and resilient faith and that they would be a blessing to the world, God. We're so grateful for these families and just pray that you would watch over them in all that they say and do and that all of us would just give glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's celebrate this decision. Good morning, everybody. Great to see you all. And hi to those of you who are watching online as well. I have got some hot water last night, went well, but I've got this dry cough thing, and hopefully I won't break into a, a major coughing fit while I'm, uh, while I'm preaching. Um, before we start, I do want to tell you about, uh, we have a couple of our Reach Global missionaries, that's our the missionary wing of our denomination, the Evangelical Free Church of America. 
and um, they're, they're out there, and if you'd like to learn a little bit more about their work, they specifically work in the Middle East and North Africa, and it's a, uh, an area that is very, very difficult uh, for missions work, and we are partnering with that movement, the, the consortium that's, that's, that's forming. And uh, so if you'd like to know a little bit more about what they're doing, you can go up there and ask them or just go up and and say hi. Uh, I know they have some treats, and they have some uh, some little like tea, coffee, something. I think it's a chai type thing that you can have. So um, check it out uh, on your way out. So we're in our second week of a sermon. Uh, I'm calling <clears throat> a non-anxious presence. And so sorry if you're here for the first time. This is week two, but I'm going to give you an overview of last week and pick up uh, where we left off last week. So it's based, this two-part sermon is based on several parables in Matthew chapter 13 and an explanation of the parable, Uh, and we focused on just the parable, the first parable, last week. So we'll look at the other two parables and then um, uh, the explanation of that first parable. So the first parable is called the wheat and the weeds, the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And in the parable, a, a farmer plants wheat, but an enemy comes during the night and sows seed for weeds, but not just any kind of weeds. It's the kind of weed that it was toxic, looked like wheat. If you didn't separate it out from the wheat, you would have major, major problems. The servants come in, and they're all alarmed by it, and they're so alarmed that agricultural people back then, you you wouldn't read the alarm, but you understand when they say, let's go out, should we go out and pull out the weeds, that that's kind of a drastic action. And the owner remains calm, and the owner says, no, wait. You know, wait until the harvest is, is, is until we bring it in. Then we will separate the two, because if you go out right now, you're going you're gonna to pull out the wheat along with the weeds. And so he is in the midst of that. It's, one of the, it's a twist in the story. It's the, the owner of the field is a non-anxious presence in the midst of something that's very alarming. An enemy has come and sown weeds. And the lesson we took from the parable as it relates to anxiety and fear in our lives is that whatever we're going through, whatever it is that we're facing, God is still in charge. And that's all throughout the scripture. He's present. He cares. He has a plan. He's going to accomplish his plan. And he's calm. We, a lot of times, we're going crazy. God is never pulling out his hair, running around, screeching. God is a caring and powerful, non-anxious presence, no matter what threat we're facing in our lives. So knowing this and trusting God in whatever it is that we're facing doesn't eliminate worry and fear. It doesn't like just completely lift it up all the time. But as we learn to trust him, we can have a growing sense of peace alongside with that anxiety and fear that we experience. And um, we can more and more reflect that non-anxious presence of God in the situations that we face. And so last week we talked about a simple prayer, very simple prayer that we can pray as we're going throughout our day or as we're walking into a situation that has, you know, it's, it's a charged situation. It's a simple prayer. It's simply, Jesus, you're already in this situation. It's not like thinking, I'm going to bring God with me or something. No, you're already in this situation. But there's more that we can glean from Jesus' parable in this chapter that help us prepare for highly charged, anxiety-inducing type of situations that we face. And the hope is that we will more and more reflect the non-anxious presence of Jesus as we enter those situations. And not only for our own sakes, but for the sakes of the people around us, and not even for the sakes just of the people around us, for the sake of Christ, to honor him and bring him glory. So we're in a series uh, that's called Secrets of the Realm. That's uh, from what, how Jesus describes the parables in this chapter. And it's a series through Matthew Uh, 13, I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 13. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one of the Bibles from the seat rack in front of you 
And there's a table of contents, but Matthew's about four-fifths of the way into the Bible. Most of the Bible is Old Testament, and you've got a much smaller New Testament at the end. And as you're opening your Bibles, I want to remind you, as I do every week, that understanding the Bible, understanding your place in this story that is unfolding, that God teaches us about, understanding that doesn't have to be a mystery. God wants to reveal that to us, and he does in his word. There's mysterious aspects to it. But God doesn't leave us in the dark about what he's about and who he is and who we are and what our life can look like as we follow him. So let's pray together as we approach the scripture. Please pray the prayer with me that's on the screen. God of welcome, thank you for inviting us into your family so that we might sit at your table and feast on your word May we receive all the nourishment you have prepared for us today through your illuminating spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to read two of the parables that we read last week but didn't talk about at all. And I've already retold the story about the wheat and the weeds. So pick up in verse 31 of Matthew 13. Uh, where it says, he told him another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told him still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. All right, so one of our five ochres is going to read our passage for today, which begins in verse 36. So follow along, please. Matthew 13, 36 through 43. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds were pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. All right, so we're not going to go into great detail on these. I've been told this is a weekend where I have to be short. And for once, I actually listened. So uh, there's a common theme that runs through all of this, through all the parables and even through the explanation of the parable of the wheat and the weeds. And the common theme is, wait for it. That's it, actually. Wait for it. <laughs> That's the common theme. <laughs> it's, it's waiting. In the parable of the wheat and the weeds, wait for the harvest. In the parable of the mustard seed, wait for the day when the seed, the kingdom of heaven, it's just a seed now, it's small, becomes, you know, this tree. In the parable 11, wait for the leaven to do its work through the dough. And in the explanation of the parable of the wheat and the weeds, among other things, wait for the judgment. These, these all speak to our daily anxieties. That's where we're focused uh, today and last week. It, it also speaks to some pretty big picture type of concerns. Because if, if you were to say, what, what is it mostly speaking to? It's mostly speaking to this big picture of when is God going to bring his kingdom in fullness where he will rule on earth as he does in heaven? Because there is so much pain, so much brokenness and death and wars and all this sort of thing. When is God going to do that? That's, that's the big picture. And, and we spend many weeks you know, throughout the years talking about many of those big pictures. But today we're, we're looking at this very personal, what does this speak? to our daily anxieties and fears. Okay, how does this speak to our daily anxieties and fears? So here's a key lesson. Take the long view. Take the long view. Facing 
a health crisis uh, that's shaking you up, take the long view. Among other things, take the long view. Going into that, like we talked last week, into that extended family dinner in a political season when things can get really charged and people can get really angry at each other and, and sometimes not talking to each other for weeks. At least as far as you're concerned, take the long view. Go into that taking the long view. Have a huge project at work. You're in charge. Not quite sure what to do. It's overwhelming you. Take the long view. Uh, entering a crucial conversation with someone. It's the kind of conversation that can go south pretty quickly. In all that you do and say, how you see it, in everything that you experience in it, take the long view. There's a book that has had a profound impact on me and on my leadership. It's called The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. And I've referenced it in the resource section of your sermon application guide, but uh, also it's part of our continuing education, kind of a regular thing that we read as a governing board. We've done it a couple of times over the years, We've done it with our, uh, our staff lead team as well. And the, the basic idea behind the book, is really hard to kind of explain, uh, but there's a thing out there called game theory, looking at life through game theory. It's not turning it into a board game. It's not minimizing what life is. It's just looking at life through game theory. And the idea behind it is that we play in two different kinds of games in our life. We play in finite games and we play in infinite games. Finite games they have a very clear beginning and end. There's a score that you can follow. You can see it you know, on a scoreboard. It shows you in the end, at the end of the time that is set for the game or the moves that are meant for the game. It, it can tell you whether you won or you lost. And everybody who goes into the game usually agrees to the rules and understands the rules they understand what a win entails, and they agree on the scoring. Okay, they might disagree along the way. The ref made a bad decision, you know, those kinds of things. But the whole idea is it's a finite game. It's, it's clear rules, beginning and end. Infinite games really have no end. Uh, there's no clear way to keep score that everybody just that's in that game agrees on. Infinite games are about ultimately about staying in the game. It's about staying in the game. They're about longevity. And Cynic also makes the point that if you play an infinite game as if it was a finite game, there are predictable bad results. Here's the thing. Cynic argues that business, for example, is an infinite game. And hardly anybody realizes it. Everybody sets these arbitrary goals and competitions and we've got to beat these people and this is what beating them is. And he says, it's all arbitrary. <laughs> it's not, it, there, there's no agreement that, you know, among everybody that this is the game. It's, it's, a, more, it's a more of an in, infinite game. And when we treat a, an infinite game like a finite game and it's in a business, for example, and we, we see this, you know, working out, some of, you, some of you are experiencing this, unfortunately, every day in your lives, um, it impacts the health. When you treat it like a finite game, something that's infinite, it impacts the health and the well-being and the livelihood of a lot of people because a lot of arbitrary stuff is done that uh, instead of let's stay in the game, it becomes let's win this game by whatever it is that we have defined as the win. Now, you can have infinite games within a finite game, but it becomes the, the big thing, not seeing the infinite nature of it. Here's what's even more tragic, and this maybe gets down to the level where all of us, um, most of us can understand. If we conduct our family and friend relationships, at, we, we do oftentimes conduct our family and friend relationships as if it was a finite game. For example, as parents, we tend to think, depending on what stage of life, we think of the report card, the grades on the report card as the finite game, or good behavior as the finite game that we're in, or diplomas, or the, the possibility of making a lot of money and succeeding. That's what's on the scorecard oftentimes, or on the scoreboard for us. 
the thing that matters most. But those are not the things that matter most, not, not, not for Christians at least. Our, and Simon Sinek is not a Christian, and he would agree. But from our perspective, our kids are eternal, infinite beings made for God's purposes and for his glory. That's not a finite game. That's an infinite game. When we prioritize, this is one of the ways that we can turn a fin- infinite game into a finite game. We begin to prioritize our story and try to make God's story serve our story. When we do that, we're, we're turning it into an infinite game, a finite game. In other words, we have determined in those cases what is most important in life. And it might be success and a whole realm of things from education to sports to experiences to money, whatever it is. Or it might just be experiences, just having ex- lots of experiences. And then we expect God to serve our priorities if we allow him to be a part of it at all. God's not into finite games. He's not. Life as a finite game is actually, from God's perspective, mundane and ultimately meaningless because it doesn't reflect reality. We fail to see it because, oftentimes because those pursuits, those finite goals that we have that may become everything for us are intoxicating. When we get tired of one, we can move on to an, it's an infinite number of things that can intoxicate us and keep us so busy Uh, or so distracted that we don't stop to see how mundane they are and how meaningless they are compared to what God offers us. I was trying to think of how to how to illustrate this and I thought of of somebody I I know my um, extended family who when he was young he could spend hours playing imaginary games. It could be baseball, football, basketball. And so if you looked out the back window, he might be in the backyard going, ah, there he goes, and he takes a shot. And, and just doing that, you know, just carrying on a whole game, which is great. Great imagination, great all of that. But if you're in a real game, let's say it's basketball, and you've got four guys on your team uh, who are, like, trying to score and trying to play a game, and you've got one guy or gal who's in the corner going, ah, look, he scores, three-pointer. <laughs> I shouldn't talk like that. That's, that's not good. That actually looks really silly, you know. And, um, and so, but that's, that's what our finite games, when we look at it from an infinite perspective, from God's perspective, that's, that's how silly we are. The th- mundane things that we turn into like the ultimate things. So in these parables, Jesus is obviously coming at all this from an infinite timeline, from God's infinite purposes, right? You see that in this. He's saying, wait, there's things out there, way out there that are going to happen. And he's pointing towards, he doesn't teach it here uh, directly, but he's pointing towards the day when all things will be made right at his return, where there's going to be a new creation, where things, all things that are wrong are going to be made right. So he's, he's pointing towards all of that. So in these parables, Jesus is trying to get us to play an infinite game, to use Simon Sinek's language, to take the long view. And greater peace and calm uh, is one of the benefits. It's just a benefit, but it's a benefit of taking the long view and trusting God because God can be trusted with the future. A lot of our anxiety has to do with what might happen out there. God can be trusted with our future. So last week we talked about one practice, that prayer. I want to talk really quickly about four practices that help us to take the long view because it is very difficult to take the long view. Uh, So the first practice is to mind the gap. Uh, If you've ever been in the London Underground, the tube, the subway system, when the doors open, over and over again, you hear, mind the gap, mind the gap, the gap between the platform and the train. And so uh, what, what I'm talking about when I say mind the gap, I'm talking about the, that gap that is always there when something happens and I respond. There's a gap. 
something has happened, someone has said something, uh, we've seen something, and we respond. There is a gap. So last Wednesday in our home small group, we were talking about how difficult it is to pray that prayer, going into a situation to say, Jesus, you are already in this situation. It's so difficult in that moment to pray in that gap it, because it only takes a nanosecond for our blood pressure to rise and our brains to become jumbled and to react in anxious ways. It might be to withdraw or to yell or to attack, uh, accuse, whatever it might be. It just a nanosecond for that to happen. And one of our small group members said something like this, my husband might come home and he'll tell me something crazy that happened at work and he's calm, but I'm like immediately, ah, and I start blah, 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 and he reacts with blah, 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 and by the time we're done, we're both all riled up, and that happens all the time. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah. So basically, what she was describing and what we were lamenting together as a small group is our inability to notice much less leverage that gap. We get sucked into the situation. It happens at those extended family gatherings in the political season for many of us. It happens in those kind of conversations with friends or with our spouses or when our kids do something that's upsetting. We, um, it's hard to mind the gap, but we need to mind the gap. Second practice, uh, delay your response. Do you know that actually by country, you can, on average, you, there are average amounts of time that, be, it, that describe that gap. For example, in certain countries, when, in every country, if I ask you a question, and it's a tough question, uh, if you're in Japan, you're going to get a big gap. There's going to be... Um, thinking it through, maybe, maybe some, hmm, you know, like that, before an answer is spoken. And if you ask a person in that kind of culture, why the long gap? They would say, well, I want them, I, I may have had an answer, but I want them to know that I'm actually thinking about what they said. United States, not much of a gap just not a whole lot. We're expected to, you know, jump in and you don't jump in and you're not a, you're a gap person. You're left out of a lot of conversations uh, because that's the way our, our culture is. Um, so we can mind the gap if we learn to delay our response. And the Bible actually calls us to do that. So in James, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen Slow to speak and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. We, we have trouble in our culture even believing this. We, most of us find ways of justifying our anger. And it can't be any clearer, couldn't be any clearer in the teaching of Jesus that human anger does not to produce, produce the righteousness that God desires. And if you think your anger is always God's anger, think again. <laughs> um, much less do we get to this. I, this is a prayer that pops up in my, my prayer app a lot because I am not slow to speak. And so I, I've got to be praying about this all the time. And uh, I wish God would just change it <laughs> in me, uh, but it looks like it's going to be a long process. Um, so this is notoriously difficult. To delay the response is notoriously difficult for some of us. Uh, so here's another practice that can help. It's to slow down. And by slow down, I mean slow down. <laughs> in general, just slow down. The Christian life has built into it. You understand? built into the Christian life, as it is described, as we are told to live this life, as Jesus describes what this life looks like, as the whole New Testament, as the whole Bible describes, it has built into it times to slow down. 
we're expected and called to meditate on Scripture. <laughs> Not just read it, but to meditate it. And the Hebrew way of doing that, that's to play it over in our minds, almost like a, a chewing on it and thinking about it. We're, we're called to reflect as we read the Scripture. We're called to gather together for worship, which is a way of slowing down. Uh, we're called to rest. We're called to meals with family and friends. So if you're not slowing down uh, in your life to do those things and other things that the Scripture calls us to do, you're not living a Christian life. <laughs> I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm just saying you're not acting like one. I don't slow down in my life. It's, if I don't do the things that God purposely builds into, practices that he builds into my life to slow me down, I'm not living the life he's called me to live. John Ortberg, in his book, The Life You Always Wanted, it's in your sermon application guide, has a whole chapter on the, what he calls the spiritual discipline of slowing. And um, I've also inc included a s couple of sermons, the dates you can go online, a couple of sermons that we did on Sabbath rest just a few months ago. Here's the last practice. Revise the scoreboard. Revise the scoreboard. And in, in a finite game, there's two items. I think that the two most important items that are on any scoreboard on just about any game, uh, one has to do with points and one has to do with measuring time. How many points does each team have? And then how much time is left and however it's being measured in that game. There's other things that are important in baseball. What inning are you in? How many outs? All those kinds of things. Uh, football, what down are you on? And how many yards do you have to go? And, uh, you know, all that sort of thing. But the, most two, the two most important, the ones that are prominent usually, if you, you got the thing on the bottom, the two prominent ones are how much time is left? You know, where are you in the course of the game? And what is the score? In the infinite game, Cynic says that you have to have an infinite scorecard. Um, and, and it's really about staying in the game. And so relationships become really important. Uh, and not just relationships for, it's relationships for everybody, relationships for the people that you work with, you know, within your company and in, in business uh, or organizations and the lives of your customers, all of that. So one of the guys I play pickleball with here, uh, he's uh, Gary, a lot of you know Gary, he's, he's in his low 80s, I don't know, 80, 81. Um, and uh, one time, Months ago, as he was going in, maybe, maybe over a year ago, as he's going in to play and I'm getting my shoes on, I said, Gary, remember, the goal, the goal is to play another day. <laughs> All right. Now, what I meant by that, and he knew what I meant, that means you will not go after certain balls <laughs> because the chances of getting hurt are so high. And you've got a different scoreboard when you go in saying, I want to play in such a way that I can play again tomorrow and the next day and three weeks from now instead of, I've got to win this game. You know, I've got to get this point no, no matter what. Now, um, the goal isn't winning. The goal is to play another game. So my advice to someone who's in their 80s who says, I can't do that. I'm too competitive. My advice is, don't play pickleball. <laughs> 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 or anything else. <laughs> <laughs> like that, where you can get hurt, tennis or anything, don't, don't do it. Um, so it was, of course, a little confusing that same day when I yelled at him for not diving for the ball. <laughs> of course I was kidding, sort of. Um, so what's on the scoreboard for followers of Jesus? Time is seen in terms of eternity on that scoreboard. And points to score or anything that impacts eternity. Relationships, for example. Anything that impacts eternity. Um, that matters for eternity. That we're gonna take with us into eternity. I've shared this before. Uh, 
I'll share it again quickly. I used to pray for my kids when they were younger. I used to pray that they would know Jesus and, um, and spend eternity with him. And I came to the conclusion many years ago that that was a very finite, I didn't use that language back then, but that, that's too finite. <laughs> say, what? Because really, how the Bible describes it is, I think, how I pray now. I pray that they will love Jesus deeply and that they will live on mission for him now because that goes into eternity. That, you know, it's, it's like from now to eternity. Eternity begins now. And so um, that's how I started praying for them. That's how I pray for my grandchildren as well. What does winning look like? just to get back to our example of a family gathering in an election season. What does winning look like? Especially when the last few gatherings didn't go well. Uh, a win, I said this last week, a win doesn't have to be keeping your mouth shut. A win might be to prioritize relationships while being willing to speak truthfully. We're speaking truthfully while prioritizing relationships. What's winning in your marriage or friendships in an infinite game? What's winning when you're coaching kids in sports? What's winning when you're playing sports in an infinite game? What's winning at work when you're playing in an infinite game? Take the long view to get better at that. Practice minding the gap. Practice delaying your response. Practice slowing down. Practice revising your scorecard. It takes practice. It takes practice. As we begin our time of response, I invite you to take out the bread and the cup and with me remember the grace of God that we experience through the gospel, through what Jesus did on the cross for us. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We sang about that earlier. Just thinking how weird it must sound if you don't understand the biblical background to that. He said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Scripture tells us that whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we are so thankful that you have made things right between us and you through the blood of Christ, through his death on the cross, and through his resurrection. Thank you that we receive the righteousness of Christ and our, not just our sin, our own righteousness, our own accumulation of good things that we've done. Garbage compared to Christ's righteousness. That goes to the cross. We come before you, Father, as made righteous, made right because of what Jesus did. Father, that has so, so many profound implications for our lives. Help us, help us to bring that into everything, all of our relationships. Help us to be peacemakers. Help us to be kind, to be joyful, no matter what else, whatever we're going through, no matter what we're going through. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to continue our response now um, in a number of ways. We're going to sing. We're going to pray. And so you have opportunities to pray right where you're at, of course. We have a kneeling bench back in that corner, I think. Yes, we do. Um, we have our light stations right up here, which are an opportunity to pray as you're lighting a candle, to pray for the light of Christ in the life of someone you know who's far from God. So it's not about lighting a candle. It's about praying for someone who needs the light of Christ in their life. Um, we're going to, as part of a response time, we're also going to celebrate uh, a bap baptism together. 
Uh, so let's uh, continue our worship by responding to God together. If you choose to stand or respond, I invite you to do that now. When the sea is calm and all is right, when I feel your favor flood my life, even in the good I'll follow you. Even in the good I'll follow you. When the boat is tossed upon the waves, when I wonder if you'll keep me safe, even in the storms I'll follow you. Even in the storms I'll follow you. celebrating is an outward expression of an inward reality. And so how we do baptisms here at Five Oaks is first we get to hear the story of who's getting baptized. I ask them a question and then I'm going to ask you all uh, when we do this, I'm going to raise my hand towards our baptism person and I want you guys to raise your hand as well. I'm going to say you are baptized in the, in the name of the Father, 
Son, and Holy Spirit. I want you to join me and say it aloud with me, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then afterwards, we're going to celebrate. Everybody stand up. We're going to worship, and it's going to be a great time. And so uh, first, we're going to hear Jolie's story. My name is Jolie Botter. I am eight years old, and I gave my life to Jesus when I was six years old. I gave my life to Jesus when I was homeschooling with my mom. We were reading the Bible together, and I asked my mom what it means to give your life to Jesus. She said, it's when you know that you have sinned and done wrong, and you ask Jesus into your heart and for him to forgive your sins. I said, yes, I want to do that. Then my mom helped me say a prayer, asking Jesus to forgive my sins. In the last two years since I gave my life to Jesus, I've been trying to live more like him, and I've been more confident in Jesus. Being baptized means that I want to tell everyone that I love Jesus. I know that baptizing is like Jesus dying on the cross and rising from the dead. When I go under the water, It's like Jesus dying and going to the grave. And when I come up from the water, it's like Jesus being raised from the dead and having new life. I know that I have new life with Jesus. baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is my testimony from death to life. Stand with us. Because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. Testimony.
from death to life. Cause grace be wrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. things, um, two or three things. Uh, one is don't forget about our missionaries who are, are visiting to, to go on by there. Don't forget those of you who are five ochres to, to turn and greet some of the people around you. Uh, also, we will have a baptism again this summer. It'll be uh, off-site baptism up at Northwestern and keep your eyes open for that and uh, it's an opportunity for you to make a public declaration of your faith in Christ. So if you'd like more information about that, put that on your connect card and we'll fill you in on what that's all about. All right. Uh, I invite you to place your hands in a posture of receiving as we pray the benediction and you are sent to continue your response to God. The Lord is gracious and righteous. Our God is full of compassion. He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, you are blessed and you are sent. Have a great week.